Cancellus Conference, Day 3, Talk 1, Jump Dog. speaker by not introducing him. Uh, my role is simply the Ed McMahon role on the Tonight Show. Here's Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say hardly anything to begin, um, uh, except to say uh, it's, it's all Jim's fault. Um, I blame it all on Jim. I mean, yes, I, as you can tell, um, uh, uh, what this paper is, is a um, contribution to a possibly notional mythical <laughs> posthumous fist trick for John Hoagland. Um, when uh, um, Jim and Johannes invited me to this, uh, uh, I, I asked Jim what I should put in and he said um, how about the stuff about the V deduction that you prepared for a conference here uh, in honor of John Hoagland actually just before he died and the trouble was that what I had got ready to say about the V deduction uh, then was um, you know, kind of written up and it was in this frame but I, I, I take it that the, the thought was um, the stuff about the V deduction is what it would be appropriate for this group to talk about. And now, um, the second level of uh, It's Jim's Fault, um, there's a footnote in this version of it, and the point of talking about it at this conference in honor of John Hoagland was to recall happy times in the lives of the three of us when we read um, the aesthetic and the analytic, not the dialectic of the first critique together. Uh, and, and um, uh, kept coming back to the B deduction. 
uh, what it says in the footnote is, uh, this is a reading that the three of us worked out, but the fact is that um, what this started from was uh, what Jim put forward as a recollection of a <coughs> paper he had written as a graduate student, um, I assume, uh, for Dieter Henry. Jim didn't even, as far as I could see, try to find this paper and use the actual object, but um, told us what it contained, and it contained the germ of this story about the B deduction. And we worked it out, uh, details, together, but I think of it really as Jim's reading of the B deduction. And now, I've been uh, trying over the years since, this is now some time back, um, late 90s, uh, trying to formulate um, this account of what's going on in the B deduction, one way or another. From time to time, Jim says, no, uh, this, bit, this bit's not right, uh, which is exactly the kind of thing that used to happen in these three-way conversations with um, one or other of us would, 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 would kind of lose it and need to be brought back uh, in track by... Uh, the others. Um, so far, he hasn't made a move uh, with that shape uh, in respect of this uh, version of the saying. My attempt to say uh, how Conan taught me uh, to read the B deduction. So, um, where that goes is direct questions. Just as, much, <laughs> just as much to Jim <laughs> as to me. Fingers or hands? I think hand. You can have a finger. The finger first. Sorry, should I just start? Yes, yes, please. Okay. I mean, this is this is a point in the reading of the C deduction that I want to ask about. I mean, or it's not. It's a point that goes beyond it to an anticipation of a possible possible Hegelian response. Um, the uh, bottom of page 11 um, things change if we stop supposing that the formal character of the power of thought can be understood in abstraction from something that plays the role of sensibility um, something other than the power of thought taken to need for the absolute positive of the power of thought to have a subject matter uh, on, 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 if we stop supposing that then uh, we say unfolding with forms of thought is unfolding with forms of reality. Um, uh, I, I, I guess the question is, how easy is it to stop supposing that? Um, I, and I, I, I thought I could bring this up by tying in with something that came up in the discussion of Thomas's paper. Right. It, it was important to Thomas's paper, as I understood it, that uh, there be such a thing as uh, the form of our sensibility, um, uh, which is thought of as a kind of manifoldness, uh, uh, can be considered in abstraction, at least, from uh, its being brought to whatever kind of unity the understanding brings it to in making us constituting a formal intuition from it. Um, Jim, in <coughs> describing Thomas's position, uh, accurately characterized this aspect of Thomas, Thomas's position, and studiously did not take a, take a view about it. But it sounded to me like there was hidden in the background, kind of uh, eyebrow arching or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it seems to me like I mean Thomas's position. Uh, a direct consequence of very fundamental commitments of Kant's outlook. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, if our power of cognition is finite, that is to say that uh, our understanding can't intuit, right? Um, and that one aspect of that uh, limitation of our power of understanding is that if there is to be a form proper to the faculty by which we receive intuition, um, then that can't be anticipated by the a priori cognition purely of the understanding. Right? It's just really the formal application of the uh, uh, recognition of the finitude of our power of cognition. And so so it, it sounds to me like 
you know, you're saying, well, if we just suppose that, you know, whatever, I, I know this is, yeah. this is this is Hegel, I guess, but, but I mean, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it, uh, just to bring out, it's, you know, that it's not, it's no simple step to make, right? It, do, it doesn't amount to saying if we suppose that our power of cognition is not finite, and how, how, how do I go, go about thinking that? Um, if we just suppose it, 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 it's the way you gave me back <laughs> what I said and, and there isn't any just in there yeah. I mean I'm, I'm, I'm not pretending that that would be a, a simple move um, uh, I, I, I'm inclined to say yes you're right I mean um, uh, um, I take it that it is a way of getting at uh, something in Hegel's reaction to Kant to say um, uh, Hegel thinks that um, that our power of cognition is finite is um, I mean as that thought is manipulated in Kant anyway is um, wrong <laughs> right um, and, and of course that's not an easy uh, uh, thing to wrap one's mind around um, I'm kind of not ready to, to um, I mean, that's a, 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 a throwaway section at the end of a story about, about the B deduction uh, pointing to, I suppose, a program for uh, making sense of uh, the general shape of, of Hegel's logic uh, as um, uh, something that you might arrive at starting from uh, an understanding of what goes on in, in Kant's treatment of the categories. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm perfectly happy to say um, and, and there's absolutely no just about it, right? I mean, this is a way to get from Kant to, Kant to Hegel. Stop supposing that, and, and if you like, put it that way, stop supposing that our power of cognition is finite. Anyway, um, if what that's supposed to mean is what it, it, it for sure does mean for Kant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, uh, how the hell can we do that? <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I think for present purposes it's okay for me to say yes good question okay. um, well, sorry I mean that's kind of no no alright I, mean, uh, uh, I, I, I guess I mean I, I was partly uh, uh, there's a sentence on the next page uh, Hegel does not think it needs arguing that the idea of the mm-hmm. forms of reality and the idea of the forms of thought are just two guys is a mm-hmm. single idea that's meant to be a descendant of, of um, the thing that I want to say about Kant in opposition to John Hoagland. Um, Kant doesn't think it needs arguing uh, that um, uh, the only form that empirical reality could conceivably have uh, is um, a, 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 a form that, as Kant sees things, has its uh, is, is given by requirements that have their source in the understanding. Mm-hmm. That is not a substantive thesis for Kant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, that, that was meant to be a kind of descendant, yeah. uh, uh, non-substantive thing uh, yeah. for Hegel. Well, I, okay, I mean, I, I guess I just want, wanted to bring out the... I mean, the, the space has three dimensions. I mean, I, we, maybe we don't believe that anymore, yeah. but anyway, Kant mm-hmm. believed it. Uh, the time has only one. I think we do still believe that. These are pictures of the character of the manifoldness of our form of sensibility that the understanding couldn't anticipate, surely out of its own general idea right. of an object of cognition given sensibly. Mm-hmm. Right there, uh, the uh, there seem to be strong systematic reasons for thinking. A view like that, right? And I, I, I yeah, just, good. That's why I, mm-hmm. I, I was wondering if you could give I, I, more I help with um, it. I mean, unless somebody can help out with this, I mean, I'm not ready to 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 uh, yeah. uh, uh, take on uh, the, the the perfectly reasonable thing you're saying, okay. which, which in this context amounts to um, look, Kant's got it perfectly straight. That's, that's all right. Um, uh, uh, take on board what Kant does uh, in the uh, uh, um, the critical philosophy. Um, there's nothing wrong with the, the um, uh, 
uh, conception of our power of cognition being finite as manipulated by God. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, um, so, well, you're asking not just how, but why. why um, how can we make this transition in any way? Why should we? Yeah. Um, not on yeah. the table here. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask if somebody if I could say two things. But well, I think that would be inappropriate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say two things. They're very, very long story, of course, which I'm saying. But the interesting things are this, that Hegel agrees with Kant's criticism of Leibniz's uh, identity of a discernible principle. That's not right. The, the idea that the, the, the range of the conceptual can determine something about the real doesn't mean it can determine everything about the yeah. real. Um, so that's that's a sort of concession to obvious common sense. Hegel doesn't <coughs> deny contingency, uh, and co a conceptual likeness in the Leibniz case doesn't serve to individuate. You need numerical identity. So he agrees with the Kantian criticism, which is first of all surprising. And the second thing is that his account of spatiality and temporality is in the philosophy of nature. Uh, so it, it has something to do with the characteristics of the world we live in rather than with the pure forms of intuition. That's the beginning of the story, those two points. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Jim had a follow-up point. Yeah, well, there's a lot here, but uh, let me just throw some things out for discussion. Um, th there's, a, there's a question of what John was marking as in sort of a possible Hegel's target range, the way Kant sets up the deductions. Then there was an issue Thomas raised look like a slightly different reading of Kant <coughs> from the moment we're getting just now from John and a possible eyebrow going up. Um, and there was a suggestion and those were the same issue. And then there's an issue of if there is a criticism of Kant from Hegel's point of view, how could it possibly not, you know, move us past what we want to think? So just maybe a word about each of those issues. I mean, one thing worried me about the way you said it is you made the first two look like the same thing. In a way, it wasn't how I see it. I think the Thomas variant of how to read Kant on this issue and the McDowell variant of how to read Kant on this issue would put them equally in Hegel's target range, rightly or wrongly. But the good thing is, in, in the nice it doesn't seem nothing um, to me. Um, the question is, I mean, something like this is right. I mean, the way you put it sounds to me just fine, which is, you know, certain features about the determinate character of our form of sensibility. You know, we can start going into it in some detail, maybe saying space is three dimensions, or we cannot construct a two-sided closed point figure or whatever in our intuition, um, where there's nothing about the character of the form of the understanding itself that can anticipate, or as you put it, okay, those features. That's right. That seems right. That's Kant's view. That, and textually, that's Kant's view. Um, but, um, but that's neutral with respect to an issue, I think, that is both sides can agree to that and have a disagreement about how to understand an issue about form of sensibility. Here's one view of form of sensibility. The sensibility is a self-standing capacity. It has its own form. Um, then, um, you know, it comes into play um, with the understanding that it gives rise to some more complicated form of cognitive faculty in which it's ingredient. So we can completely abstract from the understanding and have something in view, which is form of sensibility. That's one view. And then the formal intuition, form of sensibility thing might look like a way of marking that. So interestingly, you know, our formal intuition is of space. The, very, <laughs> you know, the thing that we were, we were saying some things about to bring it. Um, another view is that... Um, the possibility of unity in a sensible manifold is already a mark of the activity of the understanding. So the, 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 that which we cannot anticipate and determine a character or form of sensibility is going to stand, the form of sensibility is going to stand to the, the form so of the understanding there in a relation of comparatively determinable to comparatively determinate. But whatever form sensibility has will, you know, be in accord with the form of the understanding. So the thing that first comes into the aesthetic as form of sensibility, if we try to understand it in complete abstraction from the understanding, would not even give us the determinate character. And in, in that sense, there could be a worry about whether we can, we can have something that involves a strict abstraction described as getting sensibility as such into view, 
and then having <coughs> and then splitting two notions of form such that one, the formal intuition is just on the understanding side, the form intuition is just on sensibility. There can be a reason for saying this synthesis should be attributed to sensibility because of the way in which the kind of unity you know, that's involved in things being in space is different than bringing things under a concept. So there's a reason to attribute to sensibility, even though it presupposes a synthesis, uh, you know, that belongs to the understanding. Um, so that seems to be what that disagreement's about. That's a disagreement about exactly how to understand um, the details of the dependence of these two faculties. Both those views, it seems to me, are consistent with Kant being committed to something which he wants to call the forms of sensibility, which are parochially ours, that at some level the characterization of our power of sensibility it will have a character which, as he put it, the understanding can anticipate. As long as he thinks that, I think he's going to be in Hegel's target range. But that disagreement doesn't seem to me, um, it seems to me to, to, to be orthogonal to the issue about whether he's criticizing Hegel. And maybe just about the other issue, I'll just say two sentences, but that seems to me, um, you know, at the very least, part of, I think, what strikes Hegel, but other people can speak to this, we know more, is that, um, is that, I mean, what is kind of striking, I think, if one thinks about the idea of form sensibility in Kant, is that it kind of works at various levels. I mean, the one at which he's most interested in when he first introduced it as the aesthetic is something such that the idea of there being another, you know, does not involve a contradiction. And so that's the sense in which we can speak of our forms of sensibility in a way we can't speak of our forms of understanding. There is at least a kind of minimal conceptual parochialism with respect to it that's thinkable. But some of the arguments, it seems to me, like the argument you know, that all parts of space are parts of one space, um, some of the transcendental expositions for each of the forms of sensibility <coughs> look to me like an argument that any finite sensible being is going to have to be able to run regardless of what they are. That is, they seem to, they seem to involve constraints on, on being able to make sense of or having a faculty of sensibility. That is, they, they seem to involve a level of reflection that is the complement of the re reflection of forms of sensibility, forms of understanding in relation to a manifold at all. These seem to be features that any manifold, you know, is going to have to, you know, you know, qua the manifold of the sensing being. I mean, one could say, let's put it this way, from the first plural, it's a plural perspective. You know, other finite cognizers and concepts, be they possible, look like they ought to be able to run a version of these arguments. Now, hmm. the stuff about being able to construct a two-sided plain closed figure looks like it involves a different level of Determinacy in the case. And so it looks like the notion of form of sensibility, you know, one could distinguish between the generic notion you need to just have the complement of the concept of form of understanding such that you want to know what must be true of a sensible manifold such that its form could be in concert with the forms of the understanding. And there's something else which is part of a project to vindicate our entitlement to including geometry and other things which is also going on in aesthetic. So, I mean, it's a question about how those things are related, at least. And, and, and at the very least, it seems like a Hegelian could have this worry. Um, these topics should be separated. And, and if what space is about is the conditions of outer intuition, or if what space is about this part of mathematics, um, these are projects for different parts of a systematic philosophy. And the first question is a much more fundamental one with respect to something like a transcendental inquiry, and it should not be run together with the other one. It seems like that would be the beginning already of a Hegelian ambition to rewrite the way in which certain enterprises prosecute. So certain things that about intuition that Hegel cares about well, coming up in what Robert said would happen, you know, from the beginning. But other details of what Kant has to say about space and mathematics and physics could come very late. And this wouldn't look like just decidophobia about what one thinks about intuition. I have, uh, I have three fingers so I think I'm going to close off the fingers. Uh, next, if you want to announce yourself, you have to be a hand. <laughs> so I have, I have John, uh, Steve, and Matt. This was a finger um, to what Jim just said, uh, uh, almost all of which I, I embrace. Um, but there was something, um, <laughs> uh, 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 there, there was a sort of framework to it that I, that I, I didn't get, it, which isn't that I did dispute it, but I didn't get it. Um, uh, going back to, I mean, uh, Matt did, did this going back, going back to 
your discussion with Thomas, uh, and there was a, a presupposition that something that I was saying about what Kant does <laughs> was somehow out of line with what Thomas was saying about the form of sensibility as such. I think that was the locution. And uh, I, I, I just don't understand that. I mean, what I say about um, uh, Kant's uh, disarming of, of um, uh, the, 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 the threat that he disarms, according to you and me in the second half of the B deduction, is at a level way, way up above the text. I, I don't talk about um, the footnote at B160 uh, where Kant draws the distinction between the form of intuition and the formal intuition um, uh, that I thought was the topic of the two and pro between you and Thomas um, uh, um, what Thomas said about how to understand that distinction uh, struck me as actually perfectly congenial to uh, what I, that is we, you and I um, Want, wanted, have wanted, um, and and still want, and I want but to, I mean, <laughs> to say about how Kant disarms that threat. Um, the, the, the threat <coughs> is, um, uh, it seems that uh, um, uh, an understanding of uh, um, something that we can kind of vaguely put in place as the form of sensibility. Uh, an idea that's at our disposal if we read only the aesthetic and don't bother about its position. There's, that there's a threat that um, uh, conformity <coughs> to that all by itself would um, make sense of an idea of um, maybe not objects but um, you know, realities being present to the senses. Uh, uh, if, if that were allowed it would be it would wreck the whole project so it mustn't be allowed. Um, uh, it, it isn't allowed because uh, um, <coughs> what Kant urges and I do this in the most generic way uh, uh, in the second half of the deduction uh, is that um, this idea that's so far in place only vaguely as the idea of uh, the form of sensibility uh, is actually not an idea that's intelligible in, in dependence of the universal <coughs> power of the spontaneous intellect. Um, that's an idea that um, one can put in place in terms of, now back to the distinction that's in the footnote that Thomas, I think, very helpfully talks about, in terms of the formal intuition. The formal intuition uh, is an intuition. It comes under the scope of what's said about intuitions in the first half. Uh, that is, it has that kind of unity. So, um, uh, um, and then what I thought was really helpful about Thomas's account of the form of intuition to be distinguished maybe from the formal intuition uh, is that there's nothing to that <laughs> except the idea of a potentiality for um, and then the first thing that we focus on thinking of uh, what's an act of this potentiality is the, the formal intuition um, and I, I, I take it that the thought there is that this works backwards now. Um, uh, the, the, the very idea of the, the form of sensibility cashed out now as um, what's to be meant by the, the form of intuition as, as opposed to the formal intuition doesn't make any difference which of those you, 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 you pick on. Uh, because the, the, the form um, uh, um, labeled uh, the form of intuition is nothing except uh, the potential for the form <laughs> had by the formal intuition uh, and the, for the form had by the formal intuition is unintelligible uh, 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 outside the context of um, the unifying power of the spontaneous intellect so um, Kant's home free uh, and, and um, I, I, I was actually thinking of Thomas's reading of that distinction as uh, uh, something like grist to my mill if somebody said come on um, there still is in Kant even, even uh, um, after the second half of the B deduction uh, this idea of the form of intuition it's all very well for you to go on and on about in effect the formal intuition uh, still um, w wouldn't the form of intuition be enough uh, to make sense of uh, presence of objects to the senses 
to which one might say, well, yes, it would, but look, um, that doesn't <laughs> give us a, 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 a viable concept of, of realities being present to the senses that can be detached from... So I, 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 that, that's just about a presupposition of the way you were talking. You were talking as if um, uh, well, I the, I the eye, eyebrow that uh, you were not raising but suggesting could be raised <laughs> by what Thomas did uh, um, um, might be raised by me. We should play what Thomas talked about. My eyebrow, well, yeah, that's <laughs> my eyebrow is still twitching, I confess. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, first of all, as I said, this is a very nice um, point in that I agree that, I mean, the basic shape of Thomas's reading seems to me not only congenial to the overall shape of the reading of the deduction, but very helpful mm -hmm. for implementing. Yeah. So it's, it's a very much a point of detail here. But, um, but you know, it seems to me, you know, either one says that um, what one's got, once one, you know, moves from the formal intuition, the formal intuition understood this way, is a notion of form, which one's attributing to sensibility, that can now come into view as something like a mere potentiality for form. So, so that um, it's a form that's a potentiality for. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, yeah. but, but 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 I feel like, and, and then um, right, everything hangs on whether uh, that form uh, is is itself to be conceived uh, uh, as um, uh, let's put a matter um, uh, that is somehow autonomously present. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So, so mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess the point is that um, you know, if one wants to say that we have here a form, you know, um, whose actualization, you know, um, is empty <laughs> insofar as sensibility is being considered as such in relation from the understanding. I suppose that's the way to parse it. Then, um, th then I think, you know, we, then I think this is just a notational variant, mm -hmm. something I'm happy to say. Yeah. And it's fine. It's just that, um, um, as soon as the, the locution makes it look like, even though we're considering sensibility as such, um, um, we've got a notion of form whose actualization um, um, <coughs> is an idea which we've somehow given content to, despite the abstraction of the understanding. Then I think um, it's, it's, it's starting to look like something that um, maybe I misunderstood Matt. No, but, no, you're getting it right. Yeah, uh, yeah. That Matt was describing to Thomas, which is the idea that where Kant's committed to the idea that, you know, there's a notion of form which we ascribe to sensibility, which has to be intelligible independently of the form of the understanding. Sorry, that's, mm -hmm. I think, well, right. whatever, I should let things go. Right. Uh, and, and, and I was just trying to say, I mean, this reading is as I understand this reading, <laughs> um, committed to denying that while agreeing with the main point Matt was making that, that the, the, you know, the determinacy of this form and something that's parochially our form of sensibility is going to outreach, outrun, you know, what the understanding can anticipate. And that's enough to put it in, in Hegel's target range. So you can, can have something that really resists a certain kind of, I think, fairly orthodox reading of Kant as, as understanding these powers as being independently and self-standingly intelligible that the understanding of either power under requires understanding how they're aspects of a single cognitive power while still putting Hegel's target range and I think that's worth saying because a lot of people read the Kant and Hegel relationship as if Hegel simply insisting on that point of unity is the thing that he was complaining about in Kant and so you make Kant stupider than he is and I think what's really interesting about Hegel gets lost by just describing to Hegel a point that seems to me is you know, already in the B160 and footnote. Or when reads the B160 and footnote goes, holy mackerel, Kant's become really Hegelian at this point. <laughs> but, but he couldn't possibly have meant that, you know, or something like that. Uh, Steve Engstrom had a follow-up. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I had a question um, for John, but maybe it has to be a question for Jim, too. Um, I, I don't, um, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave you all to decide, but um, there's a question about, I guess, Kant, um, the formulation um, uh, John, the sentence John wrote that Matt um, was asking about um, 
Stopping supposing that the formal character of the power of thought can be understood in abstraction from something that plays the role of sensibility in thought. And I wanted to ask about that something that plays the role of sensibility. That's um, a sufficiently general characterization as to not distinguish between um, what Kant says he's not abstracting from in section 21 and what he says he is abstracting from. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. this is a point that I, I know is not lost on you, so um, um, <coughs> I wanted to just ask whether it, um, you then were meaning to um, speak there indirectly of the form, um, which Kant does say he's abstracting from. Is the, the, the mode, the, the, the way in which the manifold is given. Um, um, that's something he says he, he must abstract from in order to direct attention forward to the unity um, that's contributed yeah. by the understanding. Uh, so it looks as though there he's making a, a drop. As that's the point where he, he, he acknowledges or points out the benefit of the reader um, now that he's finished doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. has been abstracting from the form of sensibility all along, or the mode anyway. Um, and um, um, so is that specifically um, what you mean to include, or is um, did you I mean? When, when you spoke of our, you know, stopping from supposing mm -hmm. that we can conceive of the understanding, the form of understanding an abstraction from um, um, from sensibility, yeah. the role of sensibility, mm -hmm. um, that was meant to include the form as well. Or well, the, the, the trouble is there are too many forms but the, the form as well <laughs> um, it, but let me say what I think I meant and then Jim can tell me, tell me what I really meant if, if it isn't uh, if it isn't what I say um, uh, um, it, 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 it's meant to be the thing that in 21 Kant says he can't abstract from right so he's um, um, if, if I'm understanding what he can abstract from is um, um, the specifically human. Um, uh, um, but he, he can't abstract from um, right, some sensibility or other. Um, um, uh, so, so there's a conception of sensibility um, um, ab abstract enough to allow for the thought. Uh, um, <coughs> we can't know that there aren't uh, finite knowers uh, whose sensibility is formed otherwise than ours um, formed as ours is um, that that is abstracted from but but um, uh, um, now formed in some way in which anything that is recognizable as a sensibility uh, um, uh, um, has to be formed uh, um, he can't abstract from that, uh, and and um, I don't know. I mean, uh, th this is really crude, but a, 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 a way to um, kind of wave in the direction of the, the change. He's almost Kant is almost there uh, in in making the moves he he makes. Um, uh, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't go on. This is just going to be so so lame. But let let, let let me go on go on one step. Um, it's kind of as if uh, Hegel took Kant by the lapels and said, look Kant um, yeah, in making the move you make about um, uh, the thing that you can't abstract from um, the form of sensibility as such doesn't have to be specifically ours. Uh, you might as well be uh, acknowledging uh, that the necessity for uh, something about which you can say that is part of the total truth about the power of thought. It shouldn't be conceived as um, something other than the power of thought, which equips the power of thought with 
subject matter. It, that's the power of thought. And that's, that's a way in which the power of thought is in act. And is that too simple? I like that part. Mm. <laughs> I mean, but you didn't like the... No, I mean, no, I mean it's just the complication of, like, you know, um, you know, as you said, the trickiness about talking about forms and how mm. it counts. I mean, the way I understand what's happening there, I'll put it as baldly as I can, so I can provoke this. <laughs> um, is, is, so yes, I mean, in the first half of the introduction, we're considering some of the <coughs> categories, as I think he puts it at one point, with a manifold of intuition lying before them. So we're not abstracting from sensibility. Yeah. The, the categories require some matter to synthesize. Or um, we, we can't make the transition from pure general logic to change the logic. We need, we need a relation to sensibility. But um, we say we're doing something which is abstracting from our forms of intuition or, um, or the form of our intuition. And the question is, what does that mean? Um, yeah. right. So we have an answer. Let me just, let me kind of just, <laughs> yeah. just get past this point. Yeah. I think it's clear that Kant recognizes some kind of distinction between a form of sensibility in general and our forms of sensibility. Yes, oh, I agree. He mm -hmm. talk and he oh, I agree. Uh, or organizes the deduction, I think, in a way that, that, that reflects that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's just keep the attention focused on our forms. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Good. Yeah. No, I agree. That I think what's nice about the deduction is some distinction like that becomes very clear there. You know, one wonders mm -hmm. what the transcendental aesthetic would have looked like if it was rewritten. You know, with those two notions kept separate. Yeah. I mm -hmm. would think he'd written a longer book. He opted yeah. not to do. He yeah. Would have gone yeah. Into these matters. Because it seems to me that some of the transcendental like some of the arguments, you know, pertain to one, and some of the arguments pertain to the other. But they're all just right. about not all space. Yeah. Right. Um, but um. But, 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 but so then I'm thinking with respect to um, this idea that we abstract from our forms of intuition, there's one reason, I mean, I, I think I'm, this is just a version of what John's saying, put a different way, um, kind of, um, one reason not to write things this way, so we then lift that abstraction, is that there's two ways you might have understood the abstraction that had been in place. One way is, okay, there's this self-standing perfectly intelligible idea of the formedness of our sensibility with its determinate character. It, the formal conditions of sensibility, whatever they are, and those are independent of the formal conditions of understanding. And we've just abstracted from those formal conditions. And we've just considered the understanding in relation to that <coughs> matter. And so what we're doing when we lift the abstraction is interpreting a completely independent layer of form. Or, and this is what I think he's trying to show in the second half of the deduction, that um, the unity of our mode of intuition cannot be simply other than the unity which the categories prescribe. Um, that is to say that um, the unity, that which we've abstracted from, must itself, you know, exhibit accord with mm -hmm. the unity we've been working with throughout the first half of the deduction. So, however we understand this idea that, you know, more determinately characterized, um, our form of sensibility involves forms of togetherness that the understanding could anticipate. It can't be the kind of anticipate which has to do with an idea of two heterogeneous forms. How do they hook up? I think that's sort of the issue that's put in section 13 in the passage, I think John calls the rogue appearances passage or something like that, with the idea that, you know, sensibility could be so constituted that, you know, as it happens, um, it, you know, it simply could not yield to a rule of synthesis. It's connected, I think, to another passage you and I were discussing <coughs> in the middle of yesterday. And, and, and that idea, I think, as John puts it, I think is one we're supposed to think through in understanding the second half of reduction as, as something that shows itself as merely the appearance of a possibility, rather than being... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay. Uh, Matt, you're on the finger cue. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to respond briefly to Jim's representation of the situation. I mean, uh, so one thing Jim said was that, I mean, there's the general disagreement of, that Hegel has with Kant, uh, which could be expressed in the proposition, can, uh, are there, uh, uh, are there, is there a form of sensibility that the understanding can't anticipate? Um, and then uh, there are, the, 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 the dispute between Thomas as I represented him, and Jim and John as Jim represented him, is a dispute 
um, subsidiary to that uh, basic division. I, I, I would, just to say what I had in mind, I mean, I, I think that there is a strong systematic reason in Kant for the claim that sensibility has uh, formal features that the understanding can't anticipate. It, it grows out of this basic thought uh, that our understanding can't intuit. Um, and therefore that the power and virtue of which we have intuition, insofar as it has a form, uh, uh, can't be anticipated surely on the basis of the pure cognition of the understanding itself. Um, and I take, I take Kant to have thought that the one-dimensionality of space and the three-dimensionality of, uh, sorry, one, the three-dimensionality of space and one-dimensionality of time illustrate that point, but the, 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 the systematic point can be separated from the illustrations, right? The, 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 the systematic point seems to me to be strong, difficult to give, give up. The, 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 the form of manifoldness that is involved in the givenness of objects uh, uh, on Kantian principles should not be um, something that the understanding can of itself anticipate. I, I don't see a tension between the, that fact and the fact that a number of the arguments of the aesthetic uh, uh, depend on features of the unity of the form of sensibility that that uh, that involve a contribution of the understanding. And that's, in a way, what Kant brings to our attention in the footnote, as I, as I understand it. Um, but it's not that I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm in disagreement with everybody else here, but it doesn't seem to me that there are, that that induces the idea of two forms of sensibility. Um, there is uh, two levels one of abstraction. Form, well, okay, right. right. There's two levels of abstraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, That's all three forms. Okay, well, uh, let me respond to one more, one more thing. There was a, a, a thought that if, you, if you say that, if you say anything but that the form of sensibility as such, to use Thomas's phrase, is a mere potentiality for uh, for uh, comprehension by the understanding, then you're going too far. Uh, you're, you're, uh, um, I agree with the th thought that uh, you know the, you can think of the form of sensibility as such as matter to the form of the understanding, and in, as, as, as in general with matter, it's it's to be thought of as uh, merely potential to form, but that's not to say that, it, that there's nothing in its own right um, that characterizes it. Um, uh, the, the, um, right, the, 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 whatever demands of unity that the understanding imposes don't uh, entail the specific character of the matter on which they're imposed. Uh, that uh, um, we know a priori in virtue of the fact that we have the power of sensibility that we have. Um, but anyway, that's, that's my understanding of the situation, so I, I, don't, I think, think, it, think it differs somewhat. Well, I think I agree with, with what uh. you just said, maybe everything you said, but that's, that was put sufficiently carefully that it's neutral with respect to, shall we say, how heterogeneous <coughs> that the form and this of that that are considered as the form of the matter until the understanding could be from the form that the understanding have to be that. So I just mean that there is such a thing as as, as <coughs> forming this abstraction and uh, it will it will lead us to speak to make such claims as the one dimensionality of space um, is not three, 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 three. Sorry, the one dimensionality of time is, is, is uh, is something that the understanding couldn't anticipate, right? I mean, that, 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 that's interesting substantive thought about the uh, a priori knowledge that we have of uh, time. It is not uh, on Kantian principle uh, logical a priori knowledge. It's not grounded in the understanding. Yeah. Okay, I, I, yeah, go. Um, that's uh, really crude. Um, I, um, I, in this section that I'm palpably uncomfortable with. Um, I stopped talking about the understanding and started talking about the power of thought. Yeah. Uh, so a, a really simple-minded way to... Uh, <laughs> I, 
I mean, the, the, my, my image of Hegel taking Kant right to the palace. Mm -hmm. uh, look, Kant, uh, you're um, lining up the very idea of the power of thought with the understanding as you're conceiving it, and sure, that couldn't anticipate, etc. Um, but um, this is a bad conception of the power of thought. Um, So, yeah, and, uh, right. so we will have to have to go for it. May I just reassert sort of my thing? Because the, the question I really wanted to ask John is what he thinks about that question from Hegel. I mean, what, that paragraph <coughs> is in there for some reason, right? There must be something that John thinks about Kant's transfer deduction that makes it sensible to entertain this. Yeah. And so, could you just say a bit more about that? Um. Uh, the, the more that I have to say about why that paragraph is there, I think, doesn't uh, address the question that you need to be raising. So, the, sorry, the, um, um, uh, I, I'd work backwards. Um, uh, it's not a substantive thesis that the forms of thought and the forms of reality are two labels for those. Those, those are two labels for one thing. Uh, that I took myself to have learned um, years ago from Sebastian Rodel uh, and it, it sort of bothered me at first and then I thought I saw what he meant um, for Hegel that's, that's the truth um, uh, it's something that we have to bear in mind while, while trying to understand as Robert is going to help us do <laughs> what goes on in Hegel's logic uh, and the reason I put that paragraph in was just that um, uh, uh, and, and, and this is obviously outrageous uh, given uh, you know, what's broken out of, about it um, uh, now here we have a really clear cut um, thing that might look to someone like a thesis, substantive thesis but it isn't uh, a substantive thesis uh, um, uh, um, the thing that John Hoagland takes to have been a substantive thesis on Kant's part um, uh, uh, can be understood as a kind of ancestor of this thing that isn't a substantive thesis in Hegel. Um, so it was meant just to kind of make vivid um, the, 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 the thought that there were things you could think about uh, um, the relation between the discursive capacity, whatever, the power of thought on the one hand and um, uh, I don't know, what reality has to be like on the other. Um, uh, that um, someone might be forgiven for taking to, to be substantive theses in need of, uh, of argument. Um, uh, working backwards from the, 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 the thing that looks like a descendant in Hegel isn't. Um, that might help make sense of how the thing that looks to Hegelund like a substantive thesis in Kant isn't. But it wasn't meant to um, in any other way um, uh, I know, urge that we take the step to the to the, the the final form of the thing that isn't meant to be substantive. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, I have a question concerning your account of the relation between the in the second part of this section, and okay. it might be that you've already answered it in this discussion, but still, I'm, I'm confused, so I still yeah. ask the question. Um, so you say that. In the first part of the deduction, it is shown that for every complex, or in order for a complex representation to be mine, it has to exhibit synthetic unity. Mm -hmm. And since intuitions <coughs> are complex representations, it is shown that for an intuition to be mine, it has to exhibit synthetic unity. And mm -hmm. So that's, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Then you say there's something left open in the first part of the deduction mm -hmm. that's that there might be presence to the mind uh, a presence to the senses mm -hmm. that doesn't exhibit synthetic unity. Mm -hmm. So first I thought that's strange because at least there are two things we know from the aesthetic the first is that every presence to the mind has either um, spatial and or temporal forms so as a spatial or temporal representation and we know from the space and time arguments that every spatial and temporal representation is a complex representation. So if we take that together with what Kant says in the first part of the deduction, mm -hmm. it turns out that every presence to the mind 
has to exhibit synthetic unity in order to be something for me. But then I thought that mm -hmm. wasn't your point because mm -hmm. on one, I think on page, page eight, you say that this presence for the mind wouldn't be, you're thinking about the presence of a mind that isn't anything to me. So then I thought, okay, the idea is that the second part of the deduction is supposed to show that every presence to the senses even if it's nothing for me that's not the idea no um, it's supposed to show that there isn't any application for an idea of presence to the senses that isn't presence to me uh, filling a gap that the first okay. half leaves um, mm -hmm. seeming the first half seems to leave open a possibility of presence to the senses okay, okay. Yeah, that isn't presence okay. to me um, uh, and the second half is supposed to yeah. Okay. No, that's okay. Yeah. All all presence to the senses is presence mm -hmm. to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I mean I agree yeah. that, that, um, that that it, it, it might be that um, I, I mean because because of the thing you point to about the aesthetic, uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> there might be right more to be said for the thought. The first half actually does it when you think it through. Um, uh, go look and see what. Uh, idea of presence to the senses the aesthetic mm -hmm. provides for uh, and, and um, uh, I mean although the conceptual apparatus is no longer is not yet uh, in place in the aesthetic um, uh, when, now, now that we have this conceptual apparatus we can see that it actually amounts to uh, presence in intuition because there has to be um, what we now know to call synthetic unity in any in any case of it, any supposed case of it, and I, I don't know. I've never. I'm looking to you for help. Can yes. I generalize the point? I mean, really like mm -hmm. what just came out of this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like one could generalize the point, saying I mean, part of what's at issue in the second half of the deduction is how to understand a lot of sentences in the aesthetic. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so you know, if one thinks that. Um, I'll put this very vaguely. If one thinks that um, the deduction is done in the first half, but there is this room for a gap between presence of the mind and presence of the me, um, then one's going to require a weak reading of a lot of senses in the aesthetic. One's going to have to say something like singular immediate intuitions, you know, well, there's, there's a weaker notion of intuition. It's not the notion of intuition, that, um, and so forth. And... Um, and, um, and so then what the second half of the B deduction does, essentially, is fix a gloss on those sentences, first half of the aesthetic, which, appropriately understood, um, um, will, in fact, not leave room for that gap. So, um, so, I mean, now the contrapositive of that, I think, which was your point, is if one already reads the aesthetic, in light of the understanding of the aesthetic mm -hmm. that the B deduction's trying to put into place, mm -hmm. then there isn't anything yeah. for the second half mm -hmm. of the B deduction to do. Yeah. But I think Kant thought the first edition of the critique was like sorely misunderstood on just this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. The point of rewriting the deduction is, mm -hmm. in a sense, to fix the right gloss mm -hmm. of the aesthetic. So, and, and this, I think, can be shown for lots of sentences of the aesthetic, not just mm -hmm. the ones mm -hmm. we picked out. So, I mean, I think that, put that way, I think it's really the other Good. side of the coin of John's mm -hmm. reading. It's the, yeah. the two points been together very well, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Emmerich had a point. So this presence to the senses and, and Hoblin's paper, uh, working back on that, I just wondered if you could remind me, um, have you thought much about, um, <laughs> I hate to say it, the ineffable. So you've got uh, you know, stuff in space and time, and someone can say, well, it's always in time, but that doesn't really help us. So if you're, if you're wondering, is everything that's pre present to us really present to thought? I know you could say it's present to thought in the sense that I could say there's this ineffable thing mm -hmm. <laughs> that's present mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. that I can't categorize or something like that. But, but uh, do, you, do you worry about a, a, a deeper skeptic that might just say, look, at, we've read the Transcendental Aesthetic before the third critique, mm -hmm. and Kant himself grants there's this you know, bottom layer that's kind of non cognitive or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I'm not saying this is a serious objection, but I just wonder if you think about it very much as uh, something that. You could say a little more about the that you've already said. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding everything. Um, um, 
it sounded as if you were w willing to allow uh, an idea of presence to thought um, to coexist with an idea of ineffability. To coexist, but to be yes. very unhelpful, <laughs> because all you say well, is there's something I'm thinking about that's ineffable, and, and then the person having the presence yeah. says, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's some kind of qualitative... I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it is un, un, unhelpful. I mean, um, because of, uh, the first thing that I'm tempted to say is um, uh, uh, ineffability brings in ideas of um, and, uh, the power of speech. And I'm, I think, faithfully to Kant, not talking about the power of speech. I'm talking about the power of thought. I mean, discursivity, um, it, it's hard not to reach for the idea of uh, um, my discourse, I mean, as we now use that. Um, but but um, there's a, a, a notion of discursivity in Kant that, uh, I mean, about which the first thing to say is not um, something that involves reaching for that idea of discourse. Um, so, so um, uh, um, for some purposes, it can be off stage for, for, for thinking about. Um, uh, ideas like uh, presence for thought it can be off stage what if anything uh, the subject of this presence um, has it in her power to say uh, um, that maybe that would be a thing to think about but um, it's, it's not obvious that, that it's a thing that needs to be thought about uh, in, in the context of trying to make sense of uh, what, try, yeah, trying to make sense of what, what goes on in, in, in this passage in Kant uh, using uh, um, the, 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 the apparent idea of, of presence of the senses not involving presence for thought and an idea of presence for thought and, and thinking of Kant as aiming to say that's only an apparent idea uh, all presence is presence for thought maybe some presence for thought is ineffable you seem to be allowing that <laughs> I mean, you know, we could think about that later it, uh, it, I mean it doesn't matter for purposes of seeing Kant as trying to, trying to eliminate that uh, apparent possibility it's only the appearance of a possibility yeah, no, that's not really right, addressing the, the, your the three faculties are so separate you can say we think they're three faculties so therefore the feeling faculty is within the realm of thought but if what you really mean by feeling is precisely that part that's not specified in any thinking way other than for us it occurs in time mm -hmm. uh, it seems as if uh, you've got something that escapes something significant maybe, mm -hmm. that escapes Carl are you, are you pointing to the distinction between something not yet conceptually articulable and something in principle not conceptually articulated. Yeah. Well, I, I, suspect might, that's what you, mm. I suspect that's what you mean. I, I think that might be the way he, he's thinking of this, originally thinking of this you know, third faculty of feeling, which is very uh, important for him. I, mean, really, I think he does believe in the, 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 you know, the three faculties. And uh, there's some things we can say about a feeling eventually, but, but there could be some things that are in principle in the very system mm -hmm. such that we might make the strong claim yeah. There's no reason to think we ever could. Yeah. You, you take Hogan to be pointing at it. And maybe Hogan's reminders, I just thought, that being a kid, I think if you were mm -hmm. to say more of it. I mean, it's, well, this is true. I mean, there's a lot of ways to think about these issues. This is a large topic. But, I mean, maybe it's worth just saying. Historically, in um, the reception of Kant's thought, maybe I think the two clearest places I can think of is in the early logical positivists when they were neo Kantians, more in the clearest way. I mean, the Anglo American tradition coming out of Royce, C.I. Yeah, Lewis is a particularly clear example. It was very common to have the word ineffability come up in expositions of Kant's philosophy. And, um, and so the idea was, sort of like in somebody like Schlick, that what is given to sensibility before it's taken up into concepts is ineffable. Schlick will talk about the blue of the sky, but then I'll put in quotation marks because we don't yet have the concept blue. And so it's like, quotes, blue of the sky, about which I can't say anything. And then, you know, it gets this little dance of, though I apparently just have, but you need to understand that I'm not talking about the blue yet, I'm talking about the thing which is... And, and in fact, it's, not, it's an interesting fact that this, 
you know, line of neo-Kantianism, I think, is that, you know, historically the direct target of Wittgenstein's private language argument is kind of just like in mind there. And in Lewis, it's not so much, you know, first there's something mm-hmm. ineffable, and then we bring it under concepts. It's a somewhat subtler view of everything comes as a unity, but we can abstract out what he calls the given from the pure concept. And what we've abstracted, the given, is something which we must, considering it thus in this abstraction, regard as ineffable. Because it's only in its relation to it. So we can't say anything about it. To say something about it is to bring it in relation to a content. But it's the given which we must have, which concern, is ineffable. But I think, um, so I think there's a huge tradition of this. But I do think, I'll just say this in two sentences, that it's the very point of the reading of the second half of the B deduction, as John's explained it, to see Kant as criticizing just that reading of Kant. And just that view. I mean, those are cases where the ineffability requires a robust notion of something that is given to sense, and therefore, in some sense, given to <coughs> mind is given to sense, and given to me as given to sense, while eluding the unity of apperception. And therefore, you know, um, as we're missing the point of the argument of the first half that mm. Stephanie was spelling out. And so, on that reading of what Kant's doing in action, he is disowning just that reading. That, now, that's not the only way you might bring the concept of ineffability in. I don't think that's what Carl meant. Mm. But if it's, 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 it's that one, then it's relevant. It's exactly what's being criticized. <laughs> in, in, in her sense, apart from all the other apparatus, and the famous thing is he kind of brings in inner sense, and then so they realize that he shouldn't allow inner sense to stand there by on its own and then connects it with other things. And I'm thinking that re- residue <laughs> might be not the blue of the, the sky or something like that, but the, the thing that he originally talks about is a separate sphere of inner sense. I, I mean, it's a tremendous problem. I realize what a strategy is to is say we shouldn't, we shouldn't talk about that stuff and so forth, but I just think the way he's got things set up, um, he encourages this, and I'm not sure that he, he's probably, I mean, impossible, but that's where it comes from. Come from. Jonathan had a follow-up. I just have, it's, 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 it's adjacent to this, but it's a question, um, J- John. The, you know, on, on page 16, you say something I find very intriguing, um, which is, you know, if a particular version of rationalism saddles itself with a pinched and shallow conception of reason as a mark of the distinctively human ways of living, it's not surprising that the result is a pinched and shallow conception of human life and personhood. And then you say the remedy is not to abandon rationalism, but to liberalize our conception of reason, which I, you know, I think it's a, that seems to be a very pregnant thought. <coughs> but the question is, you know, what, what do you think that consists in? I mean, what is it for liberalism to take hold here, mm-hmm. of reason's own activity? Uh, I'm just cu- curious what you... I mean, how, how, does liberal, how does reason go about doing this thing you recommend? Uh, do you have um, any thoughts about that? <coughs> it isn't that, that reason has to do something, it's that we have to, well, um, we have to, uh, we have to a, conceive reason, reason in a different way. And um, that, that thought was supposed to get its content from uh, the particular example uh, that I talked about from, from John Hogeland. Uh, um, uh, he had it as paradigmatic of the cognitivism that is one of the two dogmas of rationalism according to him um, uh, to, to uh, stop where Bob Brandon on his reading stops thinking about the obligation to keep promises um, uh, so something like not detaching uh, the sense of the obligation to keep promises far enough from the um, sanctions and etc that might figure in working someone into having the sense of the obligation to keep promises um, and the unfavorable contrast between uh, Brandon as he as he reads him on promise keeping pinched and shallow uh, conception of, of I don't know, you know the, the, the role of rationality <coughs> in um, a case of promise keeping uh, between that and uh, Nietzsche, who um, and, uh, I, I, I quote the John's wording, um, the self-responsible exercise of an autonomous, protracted will. Protracted meaning. Uh, 
conceiving itself as the right type or something like that, the act of a sovereign individual with the right to make promises. So that, that's meant to be an example of, of um, what Hoagland describes as um, a contrast between uh, acts of rationality as rationalism has to conceive them, random, and some other thing that you, you can get only by dumping rationalism, uh, because rationalism is encumbered with this dogma, cognitivism. Um, and then th- that all seems to me to be to palpably fall apart when you note that John Hoagland cites Kant as um, a, a, a paradigm rationalist not only in respect of the, the first dogma, positivism, but also in respect of the second one, cognitivism. Because I look at that um, description of Nietzsche's conception of, of the kind of act that an act of promise keeping is, act of a um, self responsible exercise of an autonomous protracted will, and, and, and think, well, isn't that exactly, doesn't that sort of description fit uh, Kant's <coughs> conception of the moral will? So, so um, let, let, let's hang on to the thought Kant is a rationalist. Um, but if uh, not conceiving acts of rationality uh, in ways that exclude that kind of thing um, is a um, um, mark of uh, uh, how, how we should think in, in dropping uh, cognitivism that's supposed to be the second dogma of rationalism and Kant is a rationalist um, well then the whole thing went wrong in th- thinking that Rationalism can't now, as exemplary of it, is stuck with that dogma. <coughs> uh, because um, exactly not, uh, um, in thinking about acts of the rational will. Look at Kant's language for thinking about acts of the rational will. It lines up with Nietzsche's language for thinking about the, right, the specific act of the rational will that a case of, of promise keep, keeping is. So, I mean, it wasn't meant to be that I had some um, uh, I don't know, general recipe for um, liberalizing um, what, whatever you can get out of out of thinking about that case random pinched and shallow uh, Nietzsche not pinched and shallow um, pinched and shallow here because because of because it's cognitivist that's a dogma of rationalism so we have to escape rationalism to get to right. be good guys um, th- that's the example well, look, Kant's already here. Um, hold on to the thought, Kant's a rationalist. Um, so so, so um, n- now maybe think of Kant on the, the moral will uh, as an example of a non-cognitivist but rationalist uh, conception of, of um, a, um, a certain kind of act of rationality. Just line that up with uh, the, the Nietzschean idea that Hoagland applauds that's just giving you back everything I said but, but um, there wasn't supposed to be anything there except a, a kind of summary of um, what I think comes out of, of the um, palpable clash between um, Hoagland saying rationalism as such is stuck with the dogma of cognitivism um, right. what, what that comes to is exemplified in randoms right uh, falling no, short of Nietzsche, a picture of promise keeping. Kant is a rationalist. Um, that simply will not hold together. And what we learn from that is um, don't stick rationalism as such with the dogma of cognitivism. But, but isn't Hopkins' point that what Nietzsche is talking about has nothing to do, nothing to do with reason? Well, you can, you, you indeed will say that if, you, if you're doing this. Um, Accusing various ways of thinking of being pinched and shallow, no, shallow in it. the interest, in the interest of um, trying to beat up on something that you have labelled rationalism. Uh, but but but, but then, where, um, where is right? the reason in Nietzsche? If it's not a mis- it, uh, it, for him, it's just a mistake to think that what Nietzsche is talking about is subject to the claims of reason. It isn't at all, well, and yeah. it's something mm-hmm. cognitivism can't acknowledge. That seems to Cognitive be a cognitivism can't, yes. Um, Even a broad but, but, and rich mm, and subtle mm-hmm. cognitivism mm-hmm. can't acknowledge what Nietzsche is talking about. That's the point. 
uh, any cognitivism can't. That's why I wrote that dumb cognitivism. It's a challenge to the whole edifice right. of rationality, not uh, a but, well, I think it's of it that it, cognitivism it, doesn't capture. It's, it's a challenge. It's, it, it, there's something similar going on. I mean, um, that it's well framed that way. Um, hinges on a, a tendentious conception of what the edifice of rationality is in a way that well, that's a kind of model for, for what's going on in Hoagland's treatment of a person ration, commits ra- himself to keeping the promise because he can because he wills it yep. he doesn't do it mm-hmm. because it's under any claim of reason it's just some he's willing it is an act of his reason um, well, there it's you are. available to be said if you don't um, um, uh, stick people who, who, who want to think of it as an act of reason with a cognitivistic and hence pitched and shallow uh, conception of what an act of reason could be. And now, uh, if you want a model of what an act of reason could be, <coughs> such that um, uh, the, the way to handle the, the perfectly correct critical things that Nietzsche says against conceptions of promise keeping of the likes of Brandom's. Uh, look to what Kant says about um, acts of the moral will. Um, th- th- those for sure are acts of reason, according to Kant. Kant yeah. So Kant is an, a, a, a model, an exemplar of somebody who um, isn't buying into this idea, the, the idea of rationality that um, makes it right to describe what Nietzsche is doing as attacking the whole edifice of rationality. But but Kant, but let's, no, let's think of... No. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm abusing my role as... Uh, we, have, we have several fingers. We have Juan and then Jason and then Mark. And then Jim. I want to say what you just said. Oh, there's a follow-up to just what I just said. Yeah, was, I, I, think was I, got, I got you. Okay, we have two I'm right on... Good. Oh, my God. <laughs> Three right on this point, and then Jason and then you. Then you and then Jason. Go ahead. I think when well, you're planning this, I, mean, I, I think it's no doubt true. Um, if we had the whole genie of morality of morals before us, mm-hmm. the reading of it, and it was a good reading, one could get a criticism of Kant out of that. Right? Oh, yeah. That's conception reason. But that is not the issue here. Not. The issue is a passage from Nietzsche, which is quoted out of context. What's going on in that passage? I think what's going on in that passage, this is, you know, below the middle point of that book, is Nietzsche sort of imagining, how do we come to get a certain kind of extraordinary animal on the scene? Let's describe this animal, you know, on a certain understanding of what this animal can do. And he, I think... You know, I, don't, I bet Nichols to Donuts, you know, he is trying to echo Kant in his description of that. The, the reason these two passages line up is, is not a coincidence. Mm-hmm. It's not that, um, that Nietzsche himself thinks of himself as a Kantian, but mm-hmm. at this particular mm-hmm. moment where he's trying to characterize a certain view that animal has of himself, he's, he's using Kantian language. So if John just takes that passage mm-hmm. out of Nietzsche by itself mm-hmm. and uses it, to contrast with John Kant. Hoagland. John Hoagland, yeah. yeah. Then, then we're going to get a kind of weird result because this is a moment where Nietzsche is trying to, you know, give a characterization of that animal that captures a certain capacity <coughs> that he has, you know, that a mere animal doesn't have um, to place himself, you know, under norms of responsibility, what am I saying? Mm-hmm. Now, um, which, um, you know, I think not accidentally echoes Kant. And so, so just, just with respect to that one quotation, if... If that's, you know, I don't think there is a quotation from Nietzsche. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking. Yes. All, all the quotations on my page are from Hoagland. But it's a passage where he talks about a sovereign individual, yep. a creature who right. now has yep. the capacity to make mm-hmm. promises to himself. Mm-hmm. You, know, mm-hmm. you know, what do we call this special capacity? And then Nietzsche connects it with the word conscience, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. later is going to come under criticism. But right now he's just trying to capture like, what it is mm-hmm. for there to be an animal who's so describable that we can say he has a conscience. And I don't think it's an accident that, you know, in trying to describe that, he's, he's using Kantian language. And if John wants to single out this wonderful thing the creature can do, then it's not an accident that he's going to wind up quoting something for Nietzsche. So like, oh, 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 mm-hmm. uh, just like, very quickly, I, I basically agree with what Jim is saying. I mean, uh, it's important to remember that this paper of John's was not a finished paper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's invoking... Nietzsche quickly, but uh, on several occasions, John tends to do that every now and then, talk as if these commitments are just in this sort of narrow, I do it myself, and (coughs) damn it. But they always, in their more sophisticated form, arise in the context of things like in the the Letting Be paper, uh, 
of, of a structure of scientific investigation in which we're subject to all sorts of rational norms and it's our engagement with the world that rationally forces us to make these forthright kinds of commitments. So, uh, and, and, and on a number of occasions I've, I've said, John, this sounds like Nietzschean in the more literal sense, and he says, oh God, no, I didn't mean it to sound that way. I mean, just, uh, I just report, I'm very consistent about that. So I think it's actually, as Hoagland interpretation, quite clear that in, he means to be invoking the Kantian spirit of this kind of thing, not the what you're calling the genuinely Nietzschean spirit, despite the fact that he superficially quotes Nietzsche there. Why would he do that, since he's trying to make a contrast between what reason covers and what it can't cover? Why would he do it? Contra- he's, 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 he's trying to say cognitivism misses something. It Cogn- misses something in right. Nietzsche. He's, here it is. <laughs> but you're equating he's right cognitive- about cognitivism. He's, and he's wrong that cognitivism is a... Is a Necessary he's not trying to kick reason out. He's trying yeah. to kick what he sees to be a specific thing called rationalism, which he's equating with cognitivism. Which is that's a, right. He's equating right. it with cognitivism. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, is, but, Nietzsche but, is not a cognitivist. But 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 no, right. But um, he's not rejecting you know the thoroughgoing influence of reason mm-hmm. properly understood as understanding, which is embodied and embedded in all those other Hoagland things he wants mm-hmm. to say. Well, then the idea he's taking of, rationalism to be random. Well, then the idea of criticizing mm-hmm. Hoagland. Yeah. Good. For having too narrow a view of what rationalism can do, it's just it's just a repeating what Hoagland wants to say. It's not a criticism. I, so what's the, I, I, I how, how there's, some, cri- there's something right about that. I think that this um, this this is a respect of that. And yeah. Mark is right to point out it's not a finished paper. It's a very late paper. Um, uh, um, I, I wish I'd talked to him about it. Um, um, I don't know if he talked to anybody much about about it. Um, <coughs> had, had, had he talked to people, e.g. Mark, about it, um, I, I, I think maybe one of the first things that certain kinds of interlocutor would have said to him uh, would have been, um, uh, it isn't part of uh, rationalism in a sense in which you, John Hogeland, ought to be applauding rationalism. So we're kind of Constitutivism is just a mistake on the part of some attempts at being rationalists. Well, it, 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 the, the, this, I, I think the main um, uh, um, it's kind of meat of, of Hogeland's paper is in the discussion of the first dogma. The second dogmatic is just a mistake. Um, it, it should just be dumped I'm sure and then say okay now you. here is what he wants to uh, uh, um, say about rationalism for purposes of, of attacking it saying something like we need a post-rationalist conception of, well and the um, cool stuff uh, about modality um, which is um, <laughs> well re- he, <laughs> isn't yeah. really connected with Kant but it's um, so obvious it, 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 he, he wants to line up uh, rationalism with what he calls positivism. So to line it up with the idea that the very idea of reality and the idea of a discursive capacity um, are related, and the way he thinks they have to be related is you have to understand the discursive capacity and thereby understand reality. Uh, and yeah, that, yeah, my first that, point yeah, about yeah, that is right, it doesn't right. have to be directional like right, that. Right, right. Um, but uh, there's something more interesting there. They're, they're, they're um, sticking rationalism as such with cognitivism uh, looks to be just, just a mistake and, and Mark is right in pointing out it's, it's out of line with uh, I, n- no I don't want to be um, <laughs> lining myself up with Nietzsche in Nietzsche's anti-rationalist they yeah Michael yes, going back to Robert's question about whether there's a disagreement with Holden or the repetition here, um, and I'm wondering whether there's just two senses in, of rationalism. Um, let me see whether whether I'm right in, in, in what I think you're saying. Um, when something's done self-conscious, when something's done self-consciously with with self-understanding of what you're doing, for you, that's I think it's quite proper to speak this way. I'm not criticising you. Um, it brings it within the purview of reason. So it would, it would first of all contrast that kind of self-conscious action with anything an animal is even capable of doing. It would also contrast it, perhaps, with what lots of human beings do lots of the time when they're just being das man or uh, mm-hmm. um, the morality of mores or something like that. Um, so that's fine. 
but I took Ro Hoagland to be having a slightly stronger view of rationalism, which is by no means absent in the history of philosophy, where to be within the purview of reason is not just to be, as it were, understood when you do it, but to be somehow dictated by the demands of reason in, in some stronger sense, and that's what links it with cognitivism. I, I take it Hoagland thinks that lots of self-consciously chosen action is not like that because there are no demands of reason as it were so just by thinking about what's right to do you can then in fact you know for a certain tradition and existentialism of course is like this that's in a way inauthentic I mean that's 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 dropping the responsibility for, for what you do. Oh, reason made me do it. You know, don't blame me. I mean, um, the Logos made me do it or something. Um, I, I took that to be Hoagland's target, not, not something as within the purview of reason by being self-conscious, but within the purview of reason as being somehow demanded by reason. And he takes a strong position, particularly in continental philosophy, to deny that in... in in matters of, you know, authentic or autonomous action. There are demands of reason in that sense, and uh, one rises above the demands of, of, of reason in a way, or, or one, re one rises ab above habits or, 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 you know, the merely habitual, but not by virtue of insight. Uh, I mean, so, um, I don't know, I just thought there might be a bit of a mismatch of targets here between you and Hubbard. I, I actually think that's quite a good way of getting at the, the, the point that Mark was making. Um, uh, I, I mean, the, the, the I was question was being... Robert, actually. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. When you said you, did you mean Robert? I, I did, actually. I know. Well, I meant... I, I, I meant you were I, looking at... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> question. You know, I think there was, no, some, I I think there was some triangular self consciousness here. I, I, well, I, I do have a blind eye, it's true. Is it, is it right on this point that you're making? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the point that Mark was making is that there are demands of reason that are demanded by reason. And that's the question. So, in principle, it, it is a hand, but I think you just started answering it. So, I mean, basically, the question it's a big question about the diagnosis. So, I mean, why you think, I mean, how, it, whether there is an explanation of this confusion, of this identification of rationalism with the two dogmas, and more specifically, whether there is a unified explanation. I heard you now saying that, at least with the second dogma, it seems to be a mistake. But... Originally, I actually thought that the, the first dogma is a mistake. The second dogma might be just something like a reduction of rationalism to a very specific form of rationalism, mm -hmm. so say random, for example. So mm -hmm. I was wondering whether there, I mean, whether there is a diagnosis and whether it could be unified. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be a diagnosis of Hogeland. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't, don't let, me, let me say something I don't, autobiographical or something like that. I mean, the, the question that's coming up is, um, right, what would it be sensible to try to mean by rationalism? Um, uh, um, uh, should, it, should it be packed into the very idea of... of um, I mean, rationalism is getting at a deep truth about the human condition or something like that that, that um, um, we should focus on uh, acts of reason in the, the hairy sense in which the existentialists point out that masses of what human beings do uh, doesn't count as, as acts of reason and um, I, I, you know, I don't know that there's some um, um, out of the blue out of no framework uh, um, right thing to say about that but um, right back to autobiography what, why I uh, uh, care about uh, this paper of Hoagland's is that um, uh, I'm interested in uh, a thought in the area of what he represents as the first of the two <coughs> dogmas 
that constitute his. So I'm, um, a thought in the area of um, you can't the way to understand the very idea of the real uh, is to put it in the right context with the idea of the, 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 the discursive capacity uh, the capacity for thought uh, um, he thinks that um, putting forward something like that involves thinking that the discursive capacity must be made intelligible by itself and then we will understand the idea of the real on the basis of that um, and, and I begin by saying no let's think about uh, they have to be understood together uh, and that strikes me as a fine frame in which to, to, to put uh, uh, considering I don't know the likes of Kant um, Kant and his successors whatever I mean that um, um, uh, so 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 it doesn't matter about what you call rationalism, but um, um, uh, uh, think of a, a, a basic outlook that's defined by that. <laughs> uh, and then um, uh, there's a suggestion in Hoagland that um, beginning like that, a uh, basic outlook that's defined by that, you're already sticking yourself with um, rationalism in what seems to me to be palpably a, a narrower sense because you've added a condition that isn't any, any part of that um, the condition that he calls cognitivism that um, opens into uh, um, uh, um, a, a conception of the very idea of acts of reason uh, that isn't the thin one that like, is <laughs> contrasting with the thick one right? um, so, so if it's um, uh, acting as does man, um, then um, that's not an act of reason. Um, uh, um, and you know, one can see the point of saying that, but uh, there's also a point in saying, even if even if what you, how you are comporting yourself is open to criticism in that kind of way, still you know what you're doing, you know why you're doing it, and you can answer Anscombe's question why. Um, uh, you, you are self-conscious in your acting that's what it takes for it to be an act of reason in the, um, in the sense that belongs with an understanding of rationalism that defines rationalism in terms of um, Hoagland's first dogma which isn't a dogma it's a perfectly okay thing to think if you, if you, if you get it straight um, and I don't know the, the, the interesting diagnostic question I don't know what um, I mean the, we, we could talk about Hoagland's upbringing right um, that's a whole other student wait, wait, right, yeah, Mark knows more about that kind of but I mean it, 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 in a way I'm, I guess what I'm suggesting is the diagnostic question isn't really it's not as interesting as the, as the um, conceptual question how do these things really hang together um, uh, I think it's just wrong to think that proper positivism hangs together with cognitivism um, I don't know why Hoagland thought that um, I, I mean I can reach for really superficial reasons um, Other people when, when, when I was uh, there, there was an, a, an occasion when I was um, responding to an, a, an attack on my <coughs> call it rationalism by Bert Dreyfus John's doctor of right um, and, and it patently made John very uncomfortable that I, that I was saying that his doctor father was getting me wrong. Yeah, no, yeah, I, so I, no that's yeah. superficial. That's I actually superficial. meant philosophical diagnostics, yeah. mm -hmm. not, not autobiographical. Well, um, so w whether there it, is, is something. Is there some in pressure in to think uh, uh, <coughs> once you start in on espousing some form of what he calls positivism, then you're. you're, you're on the way towards. Um, that, that, right, that's an interesting question. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a little worried about people who've been on the hand queue for an hour and a half. Uh, so, is your follow up still a follow up? Yeah, it, it is uh, related to that whole discussion about common division and goes back to uh, your defense of the Kantian moral will. Mm -hmm. And I think, with regard to this distinction between the two readings of rationalism, one being, you know, this one description that what, mm -hmm. what humans can do and what you don't, what you mm -hmm. might not do under that man, and then the other one that is 
the stronger reading of the demands of reason, I think yeah. with regard to that second reading, Hogland wouldn't let Kant off the hook here yeah, and sure. say mm -hmm. he uses mm -hmm. together the mm -hmm. two capacities that he tries to distinguish yeah. these two forms of promising, namely mm -hmm. one being which Kant insists that you have to do have to do this sort of resolute binding mm -hmm. towards but what are you binding yourself towards? Towards mm -hmm. the moral yeah. law that is invariably mm -hmm formulated in the categorical sure. imperative sure. in a social norms sort of way. And that can be what this sort of like existential resoluteness gets at because it can be the question whether my decision to be to lead like a sort of resolute life can be tr can be something that everybody should accord to in the social norm. But that's yeah. clearly not what Kant has in mind mm -hmm. if you yeah. speak of the moral will because what you bind mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. to is the moral mm -hmm. law and that's mm -hmm. invariable. So yeah. it takes all seriously. Yeah, yeah, and I think right. I think mm -hmm. in that respect mm -hmm. Hogland would disagree with you of labeling Kant in a sort of in this like more liberated way of, of being a rationalist that you say, you know, we should allow but I think I think I think Hogland would say maybe not just not be satisfied with that mm -hmm. as as getting as getting like right. drop, really dropping into the dogma. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, where, where that went wrong, by my lights, is that you started by uh, uh, saying that I defended Kant on the moral will, and um, uh, I'm kind of carefully not doing that in just the way in which um, Hogland carefully doesn't defend I, 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 I point this out right um, uh, um, he, he's got n n Nietzsche Brandom contrast Brandom Nietzsche Brandom cognitivist therefore pinched and shallow Nietzsche better because not <coughs> pinched and shallow uh, and he carefully doesn't say so Nietzsche's right about mm -hmm. promise keeping and, and then he's got a bunch of other examples of um, uh, um, conceptions which are such that you would be working with a pinched and shallow uh, understanding of um, what it is to be a human being if you, if you stuck with them um, uh, Plato's alternative to the marketplace I'm, uh, this is my paraphrase of Hoagland, Ho Ho Heidegger's alternative to Dustman, Kuhn's alternative to natural, uh, to normal science I mean that's an um, interesting further example so, so um, what Hoagland does is work through a bunch of um, contrasts of that sort and, and, and he fairly carefully says the respect in which I'm saying um, the, the ones that aren't pinched and shallow are better than the ones that are doesn't commit me to endorsing thinking with those guys. Um, just so, I say. Uh, you can say um, right, Kant on the, on, the, on the rational will um, <coughs> A, a conception formulable in just the um, kind of pressure existentialist sorts of terms that figure in in, in, in Hoagland's contrasts with pinched and shallow conceptions. And I, that can be an example of, of how not to be pinched and shallow uh, without your needing to suppose that absolutely everything that Kant does with this idea, which isn't a pinched and shallow idea, uh, is acceptable. That's left open, that's up for that's up for grabs. But that, that well, reading you just gave there would suppose, and, and here mm -hmm. my knowledge of Kant might be just insufficient, mm -hmm. that that um, <coughs> the relationship between this willful capacity or this capacity of will mm -hmm. and what it binds itself to, namely the moral law, yep. does not have this sort of like same structure that you were, for example, pointing out in the, in the first part of the paper between the uh, yeah, it's not the mm -hmm. so that is the, mm -hmm. that is that's a more substantive connection than the oh yeah. mm -hmm. than this mm -hmm. sort of like mm -hmm. just formal two sides of one thing yeah um, okay. that's right it's not meant to um, right. I mean part of the point is um, the second dogma is just completely loose from um, the first so called dogma okay. so yeah mm -hmm. Jason finally <coughs> so this was a finger on Jonathan's original question. It goes in a different direction from what we've just been talking about. Go ahead. We find so, this one. Um, so you, the counterexamples you give in the paper to cognitivism, which is supposed to point us to a liberalized conception of reason, mm -hmm. are all on the side of practical reason. Uh, for example, you point out mm -hmm. that cognitivism seems inconsistent 
with the idea that um, we might exercise practical rationality in action mm -hmm. interested as interventions, actual interventions in the world. Um, and I see for the dialectical Good. purposes of your paper that mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious if you see um, counterexamples to cognitivism on the side of theoretical reason as well, and in particular, if maybe um, the acquisition of knowledge from perceptual experience properly understood can mm -hmm. also be yeah. the counterexample of cognitive wisdom. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, good. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, um, y y yes. <laughs> um, uh, um, I mean, the, the very idea of cognitivism can slide around, but I, I do work with a characterization of it from Hoogland. Um, uh, it, 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 where the, the, the core idea is the idea that um, uh, cognitive operations are um, operations on cognitive states, the paradigms of that are knowings and willings, um, operations of a broadly inferential kind. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, you, you know, one of the um, respects in which that's in, infelicitous on the practical side is that um, uh, I, I'm, it, 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 it's anyway hard to see how. The, the, the conclusion of a practical inference can be an acting um, and, I, and I, I, I arrive at that point at the end of working through the, the way I think um, uh, Hoagland's allegation that cognitivism is a necessary ingredient in any rationalism falls apart but right um, um, uh, I, I think it would be characteristic of cognitivism as he's conceiving it uh, to uh, react to the line that I take about uh, the role of capacities that belong to reason in a broad sense um, in sensory experience as enjoyed by us and now I'm thinking of Dreyfus. I mean, I, 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 I say um, uh, to understand how sensory experience, as enjoyed by us, can have the and now I'll use it, the cognitive oomph uh, that it does have. Uh, we should conceive sensory experience, as enjoyed by us, as an act of capacities that belong to and have the spontaneity of the understanding, but in the broad sense, capacities that belong to reason. Uh, and Dreyfus looks at that and says, um, I mean, the, the abusive labels uh, uh, shift, but I think it's the same shape of thought. Aha, uh, you are falling into, really, because of the myth of the mental, but I mean, the, the, this is intellectualism. Um, uh, um, to, to, right, and, 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 and then a, 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 a debate, you know, kind of like the debate that can break out of, um, about the, um, um, I mean, it, it, you could bring that label to bear. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, the way I think about per perceptual experience, well, you can call it intellectualism if by that you just mean uh, the intellect is in act, in perceptual experiences as I conceive them. But what they mean by intellectualism is something in the area of this um, alleged dogma of rationalism, cognitivism. Um, so so um, you're, 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 you're um, missing the, the um, uh, um, natural animal character of, of uh, um, Concern for coping, <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. So, so the, um, the 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 the, the um, uh, um, attack on what I say about perceptual experience from Dreyfus seems to be a, a, a an example of the counterpart um, to to the um, uh, um, attack on cognitivism in the in the practical sphere. Um, pinched and shallow um, pinched and shallow because intellectualistic in a certain way um, right, leaving out the, the um, um, leaving out that it's life <laughs> that, that, 
No, not leaving out that it's not. Uh, I guess that's really crude, but yeah. Are you got a follow up then? Just, it doesn't that help to bring out why someone would put communism and discursivity together? I mean, why someone would think of rationalism as. Well, you, know, you were just yeah, on the know, diagnostic it seems, point. It gives, seems to me to give just another um, way of coming at the, uh, the thought about which the diagnostic question arises. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, and do you mean that the, the, the I mean, you said you're leaving out the animal words, part. So like Dreyfus, Dreyfus comes along and says you're leaving out the animal part. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. the sort of person who leaves out the animal part is the sort of mm -hmm. person who thinks everything is linguistic. I, I mean, I'm just yeah. if they have a okay. really bad view of language. Yeah, right. right. I mean, it's just yeah. I'm just it's mm -hmm. it, I'm not certainly not endorsing putting mm -hmm. it together, but but just mm -hmm. it doesn't seem as if they're simply mysteriously separate mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. theses. Okay. That, so. mm -hmm. Daniel. Um, well, at the risk of changing the subject radically, I, I think I just need a little bit of help understanding how you conceive of the apparent possibility that's mooted yeah. at the end of the first half of the deduction mm -hmm. and why it's not, um, as you put it, you know, <coughs> let's see, a substantive thesis mm -hmm. to show that it's merely apparent. Yeah. So on page 10, um, there is a series of conditionals that are supposed to kind of bring out what's merely apparent about this. The first is, if we could not rule out a supposed presence to the senses that was not presence to the understanding, we would not even be entitled to the idea of presence to the senses. Now, I'll mm -hmm. skip the next sentence. The second one is, if conformity to the understanding's requirements is not what licenses the very idea that sensory consciousness is directed at something other than itself, we're not entitled to suppose that those, their understandings, requirements, have anything to do with objectivity. And it's that sentence that I'm kind of puzzling over. Um, I take it to be fairly natural to understand the understanding's requirements here as a necessary condition mm -hmm. um, such that you know, we can only be given objects through the deliverances of the senses. So if the understanding's requirements are going to be constitutive of objects, of objective validity, of objectivity, mm -hmm. then in some sense they have to be constitutive of deliverances of the senses. So if they don't capture all of them, then the game is lost. Mm -hmm. right? So as, an, as a necessary condition, I think I understand it, but the, the talk about licensing the idea seems to suggest that the understanding's requirements are actually a sufficient account of objectivity of objective purport. And I take it that this is somehow an idea that you want to accept, and I'm wondering how substantive a commitment you take that to be. I mean, in the, in the deduction itself, it seems like in order to entitle us to the claim in 17, where he says, synthesizing in accordance with the categories is not just a subjective requirement that I need to cognize mm -hmm. objects, mm -hmm. but a condition on intuitions mm -hmm. presenting objects to me. Yeah. That's, that's linked with his ideas about what judgment is. And those doctrines of judgment and how the understanding's requirements are constitutive of what it is to make claims about mm -hmm. objects, those are not <coughs> obviously <coughs> truisms to me. I mean, I, and I was wondering if you could First, tell me whether I've got this counterfactual right. And second, help me to understand whether you think more needs to be said in order to license this kind of link between the understanding's requirements and objectivity, or whether that's mm -hmm. supposed to be obvious. Or? Well, it, no, it's not supposed to be obvious just off the bat, but it's supposed to be made obvious by uh, the series of sentences that you read out some of mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, Especially um, the ones I skipped. <laughs> well, right. I'm, 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 the one that the, you, you skipped one, right, in, in the sequence. Um, um, uh, and and, and um, I, I'd, I'd like to keep that in. Right? Um, because because um, and what I'm trying to do here is to reject a certain conception of um, what would be implied uh, by the supposition that mm-hmm. he's got to be arguing is only mm-hmm. um, um, it's not really a supposition right? <laughs> it, 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 it's sort of worse than counterfactual no, no, no coherent ideas expressed in this supposed supposition um, but pretend that a coherent idea is expressed by this supposed supposition uh, um, what would be it implied by it uh, and and um, I was anyway helped by by writing and so thinking <laughs> what's said in that sentence that you skipped. Um, uh, um, the, 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 there's an idea, the reality that impinges on our senses, and where I want it to go is um, we lose that idea. If we pretend to make sense of this supposition, we lose that idea. So so um, there's what um, making play with the idea of requirements whose sources in the understanding is sufficient for is necessary and sufficient for uh, um, it can't be sufficient necessary for that, that, yeah. that'll do okay. necessary so it's not supposed to be sufficient hmm? what? Yeah, I agree it's necessary Nece- so nece- necessary alright so I should have picked you up on that too um, I don't know where the idea of sufficiency came from it's necessary for us to have the very idea of a reality that impinges on our senses um, the, the, if, if, if you conceive the idea of these requirements requirements of the understanding uh, as um, um, selecting from among the realities that impinge on our senses uh, the ones that are within our powers to think um, uh, that, that's not a stable way to, to, to try to conceive things um, uh, 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 try to conceive things that way and what you see is that the idea of realities that impinge on our senses is unavailable um, uh, and, and um, if I can right, um, press on with a sentence you did, right, we're not entitled I mean if we, if we don't have this if we, if we work with this filter, filter image we're not entitled to exclude the idea that when we count sensory manifolds that exemplify the unity required for thought as intuitings, as states or episodes in which objects are present to us. We're imposing subjective requirements on, and now this is the bit, what's really only a manifold of sensation, Mm -hmm. in which nothing is given from outside our sensibility. There's just, right, this uh, um, not referring outside itself manifold of stuff. Uh, that sensibility gives us when we're, we're not in t- entitled to suppose it's not like that um, so we're not entitled to work with the very idea uh, of, of um, uh, something outside <laughs> uh, the manifold of sensation um, we're not entitled to conceive the, the, the manifold insensibility uh, in terms of ideas like um, uh, objects other than it uh, being present to us in it, or no, well, not to us actually, but to, to it. Um, so it really does um, come out if we try to think through this supposed supposition which is collapsing on us as we think it through, um, that the uh, um, requirements that are embodied in the um, uh, um, the, re- the requirement of categorial unity is just uh, a, a requirement I put and then we can't even say on knowing on an object being knowable uh, uh, it would have to be a sort of fraud calling it knowing uh, if that's a setup that we're not entitled to exclude I'm sorry, I'm just giving you back what's there in the text, but um, 
it, it struck me as uh, sort of artful on your part to leave out that, <laughs> leave out that <laughs> sentence and then be puzzled over <laughs> um, no, how this I can think, work. I think, I think I just had a different difficulty, which you helped with simply by saying that it's not your view that the understanding <coughs> requirements are sufficient to secure the objective purport of representation. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, well, that, 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 that couldn't be right because, um, and, 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 I mean, any particular case of, of um, having an object <coughs> present to your senses um, it would, would have to depend on what in particular is, is there in the manifold of sensibility, right? Um, uh, um, so that the, the, the bare idea of conformity to the understanding's requirements right, gives you a frame in which any case of objects being present to the senses must must fit. Um, but but um, presence to the senses, an actual case of presence to the senses, well, something's got to be. Um, there's got to got to be some some specific specificity too. Um, the, the, the manifold of sensations. Hegel doesn't think it's sufficient either. I mean, that's mm-hmm. right. Okay. Um, um, my time is now. So. <laughs> well, no, your time is now. Uh, okay. uh, it, was, it was sort of, it, sh- it should have been a finger. And so, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Mark. I want to go back to the first dogma because mm. as you're characterizing it several times, you say that the dogma that Hoagland's responding to is that the structure of discursivity or perhaps the structure of understanding Mm. in some not specifically content sense is the same as the structure of reality. Mm -hmm. And I I think you're absolutely right to point out that that claim needn't involve the priority as if we Mm -hmm. could independently understand discursivity. And I think you're absolutely right in the criticism of the specific argument Hoagland mobilizes in this paper that in, and, and a response that's tied up with the inseparability of uh, receptivity and, and spontaneity. One can't have them abstracted. And have them. Mm-hmm. All right, good. But John doesn't identify uh, positivism with that claim. Mm-hmm. He identifies it with the claim that the propositional exhaust the structure of reality. Mm-hmm. And those are the same claim, only if you think, in, as a background assumption, that the structure of this discursivity is just, is all propositional, or that the structure of understanding is all propositional. Mm-hmm. And, and that's something that is a substantive thesis, like, I, I mean, yeah. substantive in the sense of false, in my, yeah. my view. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's something that John himself doesn't believe. I mean, there's many ways you could argue that the structure of understanding is essentially richer. You could think that it mm-hmm. essentially involves uh, interrogative structures and that uh, propositional structures can only have their home in relation to those. Uh, you could think that the sort of things that Rebecca and I argue, you, mm-hmm. but also connecting to this second dogma in a, in a way that isn't just diagnostic, right? I mean, as, 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 as this fellow was saying, I mean, John takes very seriously the the structure of forthrightness that that Mm -hmm. arises out of this Mm -hmm. worry that the norms can all be there and I can just kind of lose interest to think, oh, so what? Maybe all of these rational norms are like the norms of football and I'll just choose to play or not play. Mm -hmm. And at times, this is the part where I do think that he just sometimes expresses himself sloppily because he always took it back. He, He goes very sort of high school existentialist and says, well, I just <laughs> commit myself, damn it, all by myself. And, and every time you present to him the things that sound like that, he would say, no, no, I don't mean that. Whatever he exactly means, though, it's surely right that if you take seriously that part of the structure of understanding is that moment, that can't be just another proposition. That yeah. much is, mm-hmm. is surely right. Mm-hmm. And so I do think that there isn't an argument well put in the paper, but I think there's a line of thought that properly criticizes positivism in the narrower sense that the structure of the propositional is all, all there is. Yeah, good, thanks. I, mean, I, I, I do think that's right. Um, uh, the implication is that um, I'm being uncharitable to 
to, to, to John because I'm, I'm um, uh, and, and um, you know, yes, <laughs> guilty. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm um, using the, the ways in which what his attempt to say what he really wants to say uh, go wrong as a pretext uh, to say a thing, mostly to say a thing about what's going on in Kant. Well, well, and it's, <laughs> um, it's, to, as it were, remind him of what and, and he, and, he and Jim and I um, he has to take fetched, that up, point, yeah. fetched up thinking. Yeah. But I, I think you're right. You, you, you get a, a much stronger sense of his target. Uh, if you start with um, the <coughs> that I get to only after I've talked in a really general way about the very idea of it, um, the way to understand the very idea of reality is in cahoots with um, the very idea of discursivity. Um, uh, and uh, right, I, I, I pick up on, the, on, on um, his, say, his framing Kant as an adherent of a dogma, uh, put like that, and, mm-hmm. and talk about Kant. Um, but there's a, 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 a strand in the paper that I get to later. Um, that um, has got to look a bit surprising if you come at it from that really general conception of what positivism might be. Um, where what you're talking about is way closer to the surface. Um, uh, I mean, it isn't just discursive, it's, it, it's propositionality. And there's an amazingly restrictive conception of propositionality that he sticks what he's calling positivists with. Um, you have propositionality only where you have um, something expressible uh, um, by the means of a I know, symbolic, a system, symbolic a system or something like no, but that's well, a, that's oh, well, a, the symbolic that's system a gloss, that's, an independent that's a gloss on, on it's a particular gloss on, on the idea of discursivity um, uh, which I took back off from way back I mean in response to in response to Carl um, the relevant idea of discursivity doesn't need to be hooked up all that closely with linguistic expressibility but then um, it, it, it turns out that Hoagland has a conception of, of um, discursivity for purposes of interpreting this thought reality discursive capacity they come together um, that, that really does have to do with uh, linguistic expressibility in a really restrictive sense of what that might be. So it's got to be that the symbols do it. Or um, uh, um, interpreted formal systems or something like that. Yeah. Um, it, uh, and, and now I feel like saying, well, if that's what you think it takes to be a positivist, uh, it, it, this is a thought that very naturally goes with um, 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 I mean, it, it kind of falls apart when you think about it, but it very naturally goes with cognitivism in something like, in, in like his sense. But there's, there's two um, moves, though. Being because hostile to that belongs yeah, with um, insisting on but authenticity because it, in, it involves with, it, it goes with insisting on connecting uh, the very idea of expressing thoughts with, with um, uh, something that real life, real living things do. Uh, but but, that, but that's I'm putting together two, I'm, I'm looking two, at your rod, but two moves though, yeah, right? There's, hmm. there's, <laughs> there's the, I was identifying the move of saying that discursivity is exhausted by proposition form, mm-hmm. so declaratives. You can have that in a, in a thinner... And, and you yeah. can, mm-hmm. then, then there's a second move yeah. of read that thinly as symbol manipulation. Right. So yeah. throw that out, right. that's just yeah. mm-hmm. the Bert's target mm-hmm. from the 60s, mm-hmm. we should have okay. just said yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's still a substantive assumption to assume that the, that the, the structure of mm-hmm. the performances are all declaratival and yeah, that the right. contents are all propositional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and John wants to challenge that, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And that's a more interesting... T- and you do, too. So you, yeah, yeah, so, right, so do we all. So, yeah. so Except for Bob, who thinks that those are autonomous. I mean, the, 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 the not you, Bob. Yeah, other Bob. Uh, random Bob. Uh, random. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're Robert. You're Robert, right. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Actually, we're talking about Bobby. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know you I, I, mean, I mean, the question that then arises is, um, right, indeed, who's the target? And, and um, I, I, um, 
it, it's, it's coming out looking right, if you say. <laughs> talk to the book, friend. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of those people that Jim was talking about in the early 20th century who just presuppose. I mean, the declaratival fallacy is not unique to yeah. random. I mean, that's a bit yeah, of... No, the target group. range is very wide, it, yeah. it, but it's, yeah. but I, and it's not an accident that that target mm-hmm. range was acquainted with the reading of Kant because yeah. many of the people who know that target you get the right get a bunch of sentences okay, together and you're done. Better. But it's still yeah, worth saving yeah. Kant from the target is bad readings of Kant. Yeah. <laughs> um, On that <laughs> ironic note, let's conclude by thanking our speaker.